Key terms used in this course are health. Health refers to absence of disease or ill health. For example, asbestos creates a risk of lung cancer. Health also relates to psychological ill health. For example, a mental health condition caused by work-related stress. Safety. Safety is concerned with the absence of risk of serious personal injury. For example, using a table saw without the correct guards fitted is not safe because it creates a significant risk of amputation injuries. And finally, welfare. Welfare is concerned with access to basic facilities such as drinking water, toilet facilities, hand wash stations, restrooms, changing rooms, and places where food can be prepared and eaten in relatively hygienic conditions. The three main reasons why an organisation has to manage health and safety are moral, financial and legal. In this section, two of these reasons are explored. The moral reason relates to the moral duty that one person has to another. On average, every year in Great Britain, 144 workers are killed at work and over 2,500 people die from mesothelioma, which is a specific form of cancer associated with asbestos exposure. These statistics indicate the huge amount of pain and suffering is experienced by people who simply go to work to earn a living. The numbers indicate the scale of the problem. What the numbers do not do is tell the individual stories. When health and safety is not managed properly, people get killed and injured in gruesome ways, or they suffer terrible diseases that have a massive impact not only on them, but also on their families, friends, dependents, and colleagues. This suffering is morally unacceptable, and society expects good standards of health and safety. Put simply, it's the right thing to do. The financial reason relates to the fact that when accidents and ill health happen, they cost money. When an accident occurs, there will be direct and indirect costs associated with that event. These costs may be extremely high. For example, the costs associated with damaged business reputation and the subsequent loss of clients and contracts. Some of these losses can be insured against, but many of them will be uninsured. For example, it is compulsory to take out employer's liability insurance so that if an employee is killed or injured at work, there is insurance in place to pay compensation. However, many losses associated with workplace accidents are uninsured. and It has been estimated that uninsured losses are between 8 and 36 times greater than insured losses. Two types of law create a framework for the management of health and safety. Uh, on the one hand, we have the criminal legal system, uh, which is concerned with the prosecution of offenders, so individuals and organisations who've uh, broken standards. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, we have the civil legal system, which is concerned with the compensation of individuals who have been injured um, or made ill through no fault of their own. Now, in outline, the criminal legal system has a number of characteristics. The criminal action is brought by the state. Uh, the intention is to punish people who have broken the law. Uh, there is not normally a time limit set on when the authorities have to start their criminal action. Uh, insurance is not available uh, to pay the fine issued by the criminal courts. Uh, the source of law used in the criminal system is statute law. Uh, and the burden of proof rests with the prosecution to prove their case beyond reasonable doubt. In contrast, the civil legal system has different characteristics. Uh, the civil action is brought by the individual concerned. Uh, they're uh, in pursuit of compensation. So that's the intention of the civil system. It's compensation of individuals. Uh, they have three years uh, to bring their claim for compensation. That's three years from the date of injury, three years from when they're diagnosed with an occupational ill health. Uh, and insurance is available to the employer uh, to pay the compensation. The civil legal system is very much based on common law principles and the burden of proof rests with the claimant, that's the individual bringing the claim, uh, to prove their case on balance of probabilities. And there are two sources of law used in the civil and the criminal systems. Uh, in the criminal system, we have statute law that's made in the form of acts, regulations, and orders. And in the civil system, it's very much based on common law of the land. That's uh, law made by judges 
to their decision making um, and the principle of judicial precedent. Now, with the statute law, um, we have acts which have full legal status and we have regulations which also have full legal status. Now, sometimes regulations are accompanied by approved codes of practice or ACOPs. An approved code of practice has special legal status. You're free to follow it or not follow it. If you choose not to follow it, then you must do something else which is at least as good as the approved code of practice. And if you don't, then a court can find you at fault. And then finally, we have guidance. Guidance published by organisations like, for example, the Health and Safety Executive. Guidance has no legal status and simply sets out best practice. The enforcement of health and safety law is carried out by several authorities, principal amongst them um, the health and safety executive. Now, HSE inspectors have a range of powers available to them to enforce the law, such as the right to enter premises at any reasonable time, the right to get police assistance and take in technical assistance with them, uh, the right to coordinate areas or take into possession areas of the workplace, uh, the right to investigate, uh, the right to look at copies and take copies of documentation and records, uh, the right to interview people that might be able to give them useful information. They will have to also have the right um, of uh, access to reasonable facilities. HSC inspectors use a range of enforcement powers such as enforcement notices in the form of improvement notices and prohibition notices. And of course, they can prosecute through the criminal courts. Successful prosecution would normally lead to a fine um, and or imprisonment in the magistrate's court, unlimited fine and imprisonment up to six months. And at Crown Court, an unlimited fine um, and imprisonment potentially up to two years. Now, in contrast to the criminal legal system, the civil legal system is concerned with claims for compensation. The civil system is all based on tort of negligence. Now, in order for negligence to be proven, the claimant has to demonstrate um, that the defendant, that's the person that they're suing, owed them a duty of care. And they have to demonstrate that the defendant uh, breached their duty of care. They failed to do something which a reasonable person would not have done. Uh, and they have to demonstrate um, that that breach has led directly um, to the loss that they're complaining of. In other words, to their personal injury or to their ill health. A very important principle in the civil legal system is the principle of vicarious liability. Vicarious liability is the liability that an employer has for the negligent acts of his employees. There are various defences available to an employer being sued through tort of negligence. Uh, one of them is the idea of contributory negligence. Contributory negligence is the idea or the principle um, that if an individual is partly to blame for their own injury or illness, then they should not be awarded full compensation. The Health and Safety Work Act is the principal piece of statute law governing health and safety standards in workplaces. Um, the Act works um, by recognising general aims to be achieved. It sets general goals. Um, what it doesn't provide is a lot of technical detail. The Act then allows for Parliament to introduce regulations um, which actually achieve the aims of the Act. In the regulations, they set out the technical detail. The Act works by identifying general duty holders, identifying the groups of people that they owe duty towards, um, and it identifies the extent of that duty. For example, one of the key duty holders identified is the employer. And the employer is told that they have a duty to ensure, so far as is reason practicable, the health, safety, and welfare at work of his employees. The duty holder is the employer, the group of people they owe a duty towards, and their employees. Now, so far as is reason practicable is a key phrase in that particular requirement. It means that the employer has to look at the level of risk on the one hand, and they have to balance it against uh, sufficient sacrifice that's measured in cost, that's measured in time, it's measured in effort and difficulty. On the other hand, if the level of risk is not high, the employer is expected to make a small amount of sacrifice. If the level of risk is high, they're expected to sacrifice more in terms of money, time, effort, etc. The employer is also given specific duties under the Health and Safety at Work Act towards his employees. The employer has a duty to provide safe plant and systems of work, uh, safe use, handling, storage and transport of articles and substances, information, instruction, training and supervision, um, and provide a safe workplace with safe access and egress to and from it. The employer also has a duty to provide a safe work environment and with access to adequate welfare facilities. 
Now, another section of the Health and Safety Work Act um, identifies that the employer owes a duty to non-employees as to ensure that non-employees will be safe and without risk to health um, from the employer's undertaking. This duty, to apply, this duty applies to some extent to self-employed individuals as well. The Act also identifies that controllers of premises are duty holders. Controllers of premises are people um, like property management companies um, and landlords uh, of multi-occupancy buildings um, which are used as workplaces. And these controllers have a duty to ensure that the workplaces they're allowing other people to occupy are safe. The Act also identifies designers, manufacturers, importers and suppliers as duty holders and these people have a duty to ensure that the things that they manufacture or supply if they're going to be used in workplaces are safe for their intended use. The Act also gives individual employees specific duties. Employees are required to take reasonable care of their own health and safety, reasonable care of the health and safety of other people who might be affected by their acts or emissions, that's the things that they do and the things that they fail to do, and employees also have a duty to cooperate with their employer where their employer is attempting to comply with health and safety law. Finally, the Act prohibits various things. It prohibits people from interfering with using things provided specifically for health and safety purposes, and it prohibits the employer from charging his employees for things that he might do in, in pursuit of statutory compliance. The Act also allows for directors, senior managers and advisors to be prosecuted um, where it can be demonstrated that they have contributed um, to offences committed by the organisation that they are in charge of or advising. So the management of health and safety at work regulations uh, flesh out the requirements of the Act. They provide more technical detail um, on how to meet the general goals established by the Act. Uh, principal amongst them, the employer must carry out a suitable and sufficient risk assessment. This risk assessment must be recorded where the employer has five or more employees and it must be kept under review. The employer is also required to make adequate arrangements for the planning, organisation, control, monitoring and review of their preventive and protective measures and they must provide their employees um, with appropriate health surveillance. The employer must appoint one or more competent persons to give them health and safety advice on how to comply with the law and they must develop procedures to deal with serious and imminent danger and this may require the employer to make contact with the external services. The employer must also provide his employees um, with appropriate health and safety information. And this needs to be done in a comprehensible form. They need to understand the risks, they need to understand the control measures, and they need to understand any relevant emergency procedures. The employer is also going to have to train employees, and this might be done, for example, at induction on first recruitment. When a client takes on the services of a contractor, they both have shared responsibilities for ensuring good standards of health and safety arising from the work activity. The client must therefore select the contractor on the basis of their health and safety competence. They can do this by looking for evidence of competence by asking to see a copy of the health and safety policy of the contractor, asking to see examples of risk assessments, looking for the qualifications and training records of members of staff, uh, looking for membership of professional organisations that the contractor may be a uh, member of, uh, looking for the names of uh, past or current clients, and looking at things like accident history um, and enforcement action history uh, against the contractor. The client should then exchange information with the contractor about the nature of the work, and the contractor is responsible for undertaking risk assessments and developing method statements. That's uh, documents which set out the safe working methods. The client must then monitor the contractor to ensure that they are working to agreed safety standards. The Construction, Design and Management Regulations, or CDM regulations, establish a framework for the management of construction projects. The regulations require that certain construction projects are notified to the Health and Safety Executive, specifically projects which are over 30 working days in duration, and involve more than 20 workers at any one time are notifiable. Also, projects involving over 500 worker days are notifiable. For projects involving more than one contractor, the regulations identify six duty holders. The client, designers, principal designers, contractors, principal contractor, and workers. And the regulations also require the preparation of a construction phase plan and 
where the project involves more than one contractor, the preparation of a health and safety file for the finished structure.